And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most insane ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a special guest that a year ago I never thought I'd see this day coming. A, ma a man of many talents, a man of many voices, and a man who talks in silliness for a living. The one and only Spike Spencer. How are you doing tonight, man? I'm insane, my friend. I'm <laughs> extraordinary and wonderful and uh, loving every second of it, baby. I, I personally prefer to take the Edgar Allan Poe approach. I became insane with long bouts of horrible sanity. Love it. <laughs> kind of dark, but you know what? Go with it. Go with what works for you. Well, um, it's good. Well, I'm a, um, w I'm way up north, so I'm gonna be dealing with half of the day being dark, anyways. And um, I spent some time in Alaska once, and the amount of dark during the dark season, and that is not enough to make to drive a man crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, is that, is that like the where they did the thirty days of night? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that's gotta be nuts. Yeah, you're de you're dealing with days and days upon end with no with no sunlight. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out sometime. We're traveling around the world, but mm -hmm. that's uh, that's on the list. I want to check that out for at least maybe a week yeah. and be like, okay, I'm done. Let's go. <laughs> but now I now I will ad I will admit that my that my like a lot of geeks, my main exposure to you was through your um vo was through your voice work, and the the thing that will always be funny to me. Is if someone, someone, if they were to play ah. word association with me regarding regarding the roles and what and which role that I'd associate you with you um, first, mm -hmm. the one that always comes to mind for me is Akito Tenkawa. I love it. <laughs> that's I the, love. That's it. the one that oh, that's the one that is like that's the first one that comes that comes to mind. Um, that's awesome. I love that one. And I, I will I will admit, part of it is I have a I have a bit of a fondness for the ADV era, when it comes mm -hmm. to dubs. Um, As do I. Largely because that was the that was the era where I where I was actually going out to like Suncoast and three to, three other stores and grabbing whatever um, VHSs I could get my hands on because I started in the late waning days of VHS before everybody started moving to DVDs. Yep. Um, but what I the but one of the things I'd like to ask about is walk me through kind of the in, the introduction for you when it came to do, when it came to um doing anime dubbing because I'm always well, curious about that about that first piece of it. <laughs> yeah, it's an, it's actually an interesting story because I um so I was I decided I was going to be an actor right so I'm born mm -hmm. and raised in Houston. And I decided I was going to be an actor in high school. And I, I auditioned for a play, and I got the lead role and the first thing I ever auditioned for. And then I was like – I wasn't even thinking about it. And then we performed, and the curtain goes down, and the applause goes up. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went to the University of Houston, majored in drama, became an actor. And I was doing uh, – you know, for years, I was doing – movies and commercials and you know whatever you do in houston dallas new orleans and austin right mm -hmm. and uh so i was doing a, a live action movie and i met a woman named amanda win lee mm -hmm. and anybody that knows anime knows who Ma amanda is oh yeah and she was uh we were just getting you know silly on set and doing weird characters and being goofy and she's like you need to come over to ADV and and voice some stuff see about maybe you can do it, get into anime and i'm like what's that and she's like japanese animation i'm like cartoons and she's like not really <laughs> i'm like does it pay and she's like yeah i said i'm there and um so I went and I auditioned and I, I got a role in Super Atragon. That was mm -hmm. my first role ever, mm -hmm. and uh, I had you know a few lines or whatever. And then uh, I think there was another another role, maybe two, and then Evangelion, mm -hmm. which was a big deal. Which is funny because it wasn't a big deal then, as far as you know what 
th- what it became, we, we had, none of us had any idea. Mm-hmm. But it was an interesting, different show. And the director, Matt Greenfield, he knew. He's like, this is special. So we really put our time in. It took two years to film the first uh, 26 uh, episodes because, like you said, VHS, we were mailing those back to Japan, and they mm-hmm. had to mail it back with uh, mailing the scripts with actual notes written down and that sort of thing. So it took mm-hmm. a long time. But, uh, you know, so that was my thing. I was there when ADV had one studio, and uh, they just kept going, and I kept, you know, doing whatever I was doing. Yep. Uh, until I ended up uh, leaving in 2005 uh, and headed off to L.A. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm big fondness for ADV for sure. Yeah. And I will I will extend that fondness to ADV for oh, to um, a lot of the a lot of the dub, a lot of the dubbing scene, just the um, anime scene in general in the early 2000s, largely largely because. For me, that was the era where I really started to expand. Um, mm-hmm. Now, give, given given that bit of story, and since since you mentioned the whole thing, you mentioned the cartoon an- analogy at first. Um, what w- describe to me what it was like when you're when you were um, when you were first getting the rundown about what anime was and where it was differing from the aso- cartoon association. Yeah. Well, it, it's you know it's just a an outlook. It's it is different. Mm-hmm. It's not just your cheese ball, you know, goofy um, cartoons. Mm-hmm. It's 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 got a it's got interesting layers. Yeah. And sorry if you're crunching and stuff. My three year old is is over here <laughs> next to me. So. No worries. Um, but Japanese animation has got it's got some deep stuff. It's not just for kids, mm-hmm. and and a lot of it is not for kids at all. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but I remember growing up with. Um, um, Speed Racer. That mm-hmm. was my. Thing. I remember Speed Racer, and oh, yeah. uh, I remember Ultraman, mm-hmm. and I was a huge fan of like Godzilla and and all of that. So I was familiar with kind of the the world a little bit. But then it was like, oh, here's all these other things that are happening, and now you can catch it anywhere. But back then you couldn't see it. Oh, yeah. It wasn't being put anywhere. Um, so when I saw it, I was like, well, this is really interesting and sometimes creepy and weird and odd. And once I went over to Japan, uh, for a stayed over there for a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, check was all around the place. I, I understood mm-hmm. anime a whole lot better because, you know, I'm walking down the street and I'm seeing these kids in these outfits and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's right out of an anime. That's mm-hmm. it's real. Holy moly. Yeah. Uh, so I found that really interesting, and I, I think you know there's a lot of respect for for Japanese anime as an art form, and you know it's definitely more than just cartoons. It's mm-hmm. it's just got a it's just got a depth to it that's yeah. interesting. And personally, I do I do want I do want I've um I've studied kind of the history and trends of um an, of animation just to just to get a clearer picture of not of not just east versus west or anything like that but where things have changed and i've maybe maybe you would know maybe you had seen something similar to this during your experiences but i sometimes wonder if that whole if that whole kid stuff analogy is more of a by, more of a byproduct of certain generations especially the uh, 1980s because i look at say the golden age of, of animation and there was a there was quite a bit more variance mm-hmm well, I don't know. I mean, you look at it now, and there's so much variety. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is this is kind of the golden age now because there's just oh, yeah. so much going on, mm-hmm. especially during COVID. Uh, voiceover world has been going nuts. Not me personally, because I'm in freaking Australia, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, back home. I mean, because this is the one thing that can continually be done is mm-hmm. animation. I mean, you can't, you couldn't do any live action movies at all for. Mm-hmm. A long time they're just starting to get back into that but you could continue to do animation so there's a ton of animation that's coming out there's going to be more and more coming mm-hmm. uh you know over the next the course of the next year yeah. so um it's it's very interesting and you look at all the different styles uh because i remember in the 80s growing up and i i loved animation saturday morning mm-hmm. was just oh the bomb mm-hmm. i loved it and but a lot of it was quite similar you know scooby-doo was great and all the Hanna Barbera stuff and uh, you know whatever was out there. There's very interesting yeah. things, 
but they were they were quite similar. Like uh, you know, Looney Tunes, which I totally grew up on. Mm-hmm. Which I don't think some of those you couldn't even air these days. Um, <laughs> I, I think if you're cle- I think if you're clever, there's there's a fair amount of it that that can be done. But um, I do th- I do think that um, Tex Avery doesn't get enough doesn't get enough credit, even among some animation historians. I would have to agree with you there. I mean, because I just I grew up on that stuff, mm-hmm. and I think it's, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. So, I mean, I don't know what's I, – I, I loved the 80s. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm 50, 51, and, uh, you know, I'm all about the 80s. Mm-hmm. I graduated in 1987, mm-hmm. and I remember it all, and it was amazing. I thought it was incredible. If you watch Stranger Things, mm-hmm. those four guys, those four kids, that was me and my friends. Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging the – I don't mean to disparage the 80s at all. That's, that's not my intent, but more of – more of try- – it was more of me trying to figure out when did when did this whole anime um, cartoons equals ki- equals kids stuff really really start to really start to set in, and that was as one far of, as anime. No, just just when it comes to animation in general, when I've always I've always been cur- I've always wanted to try and figure out when it really set in. And I'm not I'm pretty sure there wasn't one thing that did it. I'm pretty sure it was a gra- it was a gradual affair. You know what? If you think about it, um, it was really Saturday mornings. Think about it for a second, because we had like the Flintstones was the longest running for a long time, oh, yeah. and that was there was a lot of adult jokes in there. Mm-hmm. And I think same thing with the the Jetsons, and you know they were the longest running for quite a while. And I remember it's like you could see it as a kid, and you could see it as an adult, which mm-hmm. a lot of cartoons you can do that, and you know the kids don't quite get the, some of the jokes. But the adults are like, okay, that was funny. That was on the edge, you know. <laughs> You're kind of oh, like, yeah. mm. uh, and of course, Looney Tunes. So I, you know, oddly enough, I don't think it's ever actually been just for kids until they said, okay, I'm going to do some animation just for kids. Which that's where you get like Muppet Babies or something like that. Because if you mm-hmm. look at Scooby Doo, what's a Scooby snack? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Shaggy's always high. <laughs> yes, that's. The- that's that's been one of those things that everyone's kind of accepted is the case that is that is never going to be come out that that no one's going ever going to come out and say, um, right. <laughs> but the other now, um, I will I will admit for for this next question I do have to give a bit of um I do have to give a bit of background. So a couple of years ago I was at MetroCon and I met up with um, Dave Matranga, and. Part of the reason that this is, part of the reason that this is prevalent is one of the one of the roles in your library is um, magic from Orphan, which yeah. was actually the first oh, anime Matranga. I physically bought. Dave Matranga, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, is it Matranga? I'm working. He goes by Matranga. I thought it was Matranga. I have heard both, so it's really a case of it's really a case of throw a dart at a dartboard and hope something sticks. <laughs> yeah. Um. But. He had he had told me a bit, he had told me a bit of a story about when he um, when he had fr- when he had first came in because that was his first role, and apparently when he was do- he was doing the voice when he was doing the uh, voice, he um, somebody kept telling him you you got to amp it up and kept calling him Cartoon Boy, and in the in the vein of that, something I'm curious about was what were some of the things that you had to learn or unlearn shifting from traditional acting into voice acting well it depends really because if you look at um uh if you look at evangelion for example Mm -hmm. the reason why i got that role is because i i I was an actor and we all were actors Mm -hmm. and we brought acting to the roles and that's what we still do to this day um, it's not just a, you know, do a cartoony voice. It's like mm-hmm. capture that emotion, even in the weird stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, you still do it. And that's kind of the key. So it's like cartoons are silly, but there's something to it. Like if you watch BoJack Horseman or something, it's absurd. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous, <laughs> but it's amazing. Uh, you know, it's because they, they are in the moment. And that's that's the part of humor mm-hmm. that's so great is it's drama. Can, there's always... Well, I guess I'm get back to acting school real fast. It's like mm-hmm. in every drama, you have to hunt down the humor. That's that's mm-hmm. part of acting because there's always humor to be found in something, and that's reality. 
That's the real world. I mean, it can't be it can't just be dour, 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 dour. Life goes up and down. Relationships go up and down. You know, discussions go up and down. Everything goes up and down. There's got to be movement to it to give it life. And yeah. I think that's kind of the key. You can't just be this. I'm just a shilly shilly voice. You be do do. There's got to be something in there. Mm-hmm. You know. And, and to th- when that does bring me to to something else because um. And the reason the reason I had asked about that about the whole transition thing is, I've seen plenty of other other stories where um where some some people were able to adapt adapt um like a duck takes the water when it comes to shifting from a more a more uh, visual body language type of medium like in traditional acting and then having to do all of that with just with just voice, right? Um, and uh, and others um have others it's more of a learning process as if they were as if they were trying to catch and play baseball with their other hand. Right. Because not everybody's going to be a switch hitter. And in, in, that, in, that particular reg- in that particular regard, the next thing I wanted to ask is on, for lack of a better term, vocal endurance. What were, what, what were some of the things that you would, that you would, do, that you would do to make sure that you, your voice didn't get blown out when it came to scenes with, Either long stretches of, of talking, doing it over multiple takes, or stretches where you had to do a whole lot of yelling. Right. Well, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the first question real quick mm-hmm. um, because there is a difference between acting on, you know, in a booth by yourself, mm-hmm. looking at uh, a scene that has already been uh, acted before in a different language, and so what you're really confined to what you see on the screen. You're not mm-hmm. free to kind of go nuts with it because um, you can only do it within the mouth flaps. It's yeah. it's actually uh, – dubbing is the hardest voiceover job in the world, and it, it pays the least actually. <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, but you know you are stuck with that, so you've got to be able to be much more subtle mm-hmm. and you know really get in there without movement. That's the hard part because some of those microphones are really sensitive, and you can't move a muscle, and yet you're having a big raging fight scene. So it's mm-hmm. like, well, how do you do that? It's it's difficult, um, and it is a different set of skills. And there are some people who come off of who's been doing, you know, uh, video acting for so long. It takes a process to mm-hmm. to pull them down to where they can understand it. Because they've been doing it so long. So, but me, I being an actor in Houston, you know, as an actor in Houston, you don't get into a niche. You have to do everything. So, you know, it's like, what do you do? Uh, I do film. I do radio. I do TV. I'll do uh, training films. I'll do voiceover. I do da 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 da. You do everything because that's the only way you're going to work. Mm-hmm. And whereas in like L.A. or Hollywood, oh, you're a voice actor. No, I'm an actor, but I do a lot of voices. Oh, what kind of voices? Well, I've done some anime. Oh, you're an anime guy. No, I'm I'm an actor, and I also do some voices. So you're a voice guy, and it's round and round and round like that, and it's nuts. Yeah. So to deal with vocal strength, it's you know it comes to I've had you know I have a I love to say it, nobody cares. A baccalaureate degree from the honors program, majoring mm-hmm. in drama from the University of Houston, one of mm-hmm. the best drama schools at the time, mm-hmm. and nobody gives a crap. <laughs> but I was trained, so I've been doing. You know, voice work. I've been doing acting for a long time, so mm-hmm. a lot of time when you're screaming, you have to understand how to scream with your diaphragm, so you're not blowing out your throat. Mm-hmm. You're actually pushing the air out from your stomach and from your diaphragm. That's very, very helpful. Um, and also, when you do a lot of voices, uh, different things that you're working on with your mouth, you're just playing all the time. Mm-hmm. You ask any other voice actor, and it's like, do you? mess around with different voices all the time they go sure do all the time all day long you know i just yeah. you just try something you put it in a different part of your mouth you know mm-hmm. you use the the same voice in a different part of your mouth that says yep sure do we'll put it in the back of your throat yep sure do you mm-hmm. know it's just different um so you just play around with that so what you're doing is you're utilizing all the little muscles in your mouth that most people never use and so you're working with your nasal uh your throat your tongue, your your mouth, move everything. It, mm-hmm. You just use it more and more. So as you mm-hmm. use it more and more, it gets stronger and stronger. Yeah. So that's the best thing I can tell you is just keep doing it, keep mm-hmm. talking goof. Yeah. Um, now obviously, 
while I might have some bursts of having of having to talk goofy here here in the temple, most of the time I have most of the time I have to I have to um go with a very level level approach. But that and that was the reason why why um I asked about endurance. Is that more, is that also a case of learning to speak f- through a diaphragm? Um, it helps. You know, it depends on the character, though. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to really know where to put it because once you get a character, you have to hold that character. So that's another big trick that a lot of people don't understand. It's not about doing a, a silly voice. It's being able to hold that voice mm-hmm. for you know sometimes eight hours, and and you know have the same voice, and then you know weeks later, months later, years later, come back and recreate that voice to do pickups or something. You never know, or a mm-hmm. new uh, twist on it. <clears throat> so it just depends. Like I say, the more you use your voice, the more you do it, the stronger it gets. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much the easiest thing I can tell you is just, like I said, keep talking goofy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I always end up coming back to that whole line of the one way you get into Carnegie Hall, practice. Yeah. Well, people ask me, you know, when we go to conventions, mm-hmm. you know, around the world, it's always we always get the same like five or ten questions, mm-hmm. and one of them is always, well, I, I want to be a voice actor. How do I get into it? You know, and like we all say, we all say the same thing. Mm-hmm. What's the second word? Actor. <laughs> Does that give you a clue? Yeah. <clears throat> Take acting lessons. You know, I mean, yes, some people do get to, uh, you know, pop in because of wherever they came from whatever they did mm-hmm. uh, and they just fall into it but most people are actors they've gotten they've had actor training mm-hmm. uh, and that's that's a big key so take the acting lessons get those done and uh, then network 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 mm-hmm. that's been my my thing it's like get the lessons and then network and then start talking to people get to know people uh, let them know who you are, start developing those relationships, because that's where I get 90% of all my, my gigs from, if not more. Yeah. And truth be, truth be told, there was, um, for what it's worth, part of the reason I, um, I've never asked that question is, for, for one, um, I had, there was, and I've never told this, but there was a point in time where I did, con- where I did consider it, but as time went on, I started studying more and more. I came, I came to realize that, that isn't that wasn't exactly where my pa- where my passion lay. It was in um, storytelling, not in not in terms of not in terms of writing per se, but in terms of the ability to share stories the same way that would the same way that we'd all share um, scary stories around a campfire. Some of it right. may be from maybe due to the fact that I've spent so long in the um, world of tabletop RPGs where you mm-hmm. have to be a storyteller uh, and a very improvised storyteller at that. But it's, but it's all about, for me, it's all about um, the ability to share those kind of stories. Right. And to that end, since, since you mentioned conventions, I want to touch on that. Now, before before you had done voice acting, were were you were you familiar with convention scenes and had you been to any and what and talk to me about your first experience going to strictly speaking a anime convention? Sure. Uh, well, funny, I had no idea about conventions, not a clue. Uh, I did ADV and mm-hmm. I had uh, no idea what that was about. Mm-hmm. Didn't have a clue. Uh, and I, so I, I, they, what happened was I got asked to an, a convention in Chicago called ASIN, uh, which is ASIN one. So mm-hmm. A-C-E-N and as uh, anime Chicago, uh, something. And, um, it was the very, very first one. And I didn't know crap. I had never been and we went and it was just silly and I, I had no idea. People were like, oh, you know, they're wanting my autograph. I'm like, what? I don't have anything to sign. <laughs> I have no idea. And um, so I was just there and and hanging out with other people and met lots of awesome people that mm-hmm. I've I've known to this day. And that was like the only convention I had ever gone to. And then I didn't do anything for years. Mm-hmm. So then. Uh, years later, after uh, a divorce and everything, and I moved from Houston out to L.A. and had to start over, 
Um, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no idea. I've got nothing. I'm, ah, what do I want to do? And I said, I really, I want to travel the world. I want to eat good food and just have fun for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was telling Amanda this, and she goes, you know you're famous, right? <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. She's like, there are conventions. They'll fly you all over the world and, and you know, give you money, and, and you can sign autographs and party your ass off. I was like, I'm in. Where do I sign up? You know? <laughs> and I, I had no idea, so I was going to a couple of, you know, here and there. I didn't. I didn't know how to act. I was probably an asshole. And, and oh, I'm sorry. Can I curse on here? I mean, oh, oh, feel free. We use the seven dirty words all the time in the, in the temple. Beautiful. Beautiful. I mean, uh, you know, as I've speak in front of a lot of people, and I'm like, guys, it's yeah. <laughs> my my stuff is adult, eighteen plus for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I say, um, you know, so I just partied my ass off around the world for a while. One year, I did eight countries and twenty five cities. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just like, wow, this is you know phenomenal. And, uh, and then it just I started doing other things and I didn't go to as many. But so now I do like maybe one or two a year. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently still at my last one. This is a nine month long convention, to be honest. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, it was crazy. So when I started going to conventions, uh, I'll give you a quick fun story. One of the first conventions that I did was a little one in Lancaster, California, right out, an hour and a half outside of L.A. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and I had no idea who was there. And it was, I mean, it was Kyle Bear, Vic mm -hmm. Mignogna, um, uh, Kirby Morrow, uh, one of the uh, the brothers, uh, Michael Dobson, mm -hmm. and who else? Uh, June Foray was there. Um, and I was like, holy, I didn't know any of these people until June Foray. She's like 80 at the time. And she gets up there and starts doing, uh, you know, Rocky from Bullwinkle and Sasha from Bullwinkle and Jokey Smurf. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, these voices are coming out of this, this, this older lady. I was like, I don't have a clue, but you're amazing. And, <laughs> and it was just crazy. And at that uh, this is the first time I'm actually telling this anywhere because mm -hmm. um, sadly Kirby Morrow passed away recently and mm -hmm. he was such a nice guy and it was so unexpected and out of the blue. Um, but you know, I've told the story forever from What Happens at the Con Stays at the Con, the book mm -hmm. that I wrote about you know crazy mm -hmm. things that happen at the con. Yeah. There's a story called uh, Dances with Porn Stars. Well, <laughs> that was an Eddie Van Halen's house back in the in L.A., and it was Kirby introduced me to everybody and said, yeah, I'm going to go to a party. You want to go with me? I'm like, yes, sir. You know, and off we went. Mm -hmm. I just met the guy and we were like, we had a blast and it was amazing. So um, that's that was my kind of introduction to the con world. I'm like, does this happen? Oh, my God, I'm in. Yeah. And uh, it was crazy, mm -hmm. crazy, crazy. <clears throat> so, you know, and I just started going around the world and I developed panels that I talk about, you know, how to be a freaking genius voice actor, what mm -hmm. happens at the con stays at the con, and don't kill your date and other cooking tips, which became my book, Food Game, A Man's Ultimate Recipe for Dating Success, and mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. It's just amazing. The con scene is fantastic. And now I understand, you know, it's it's so for the fans. So you got to mm -hmm. shift and you got to really be there for the fans. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I had to learn the first few years I was, you know, going at it. So, yeah. so if anybody I pissed off back in the day, I'm sorry. I drank a little. <laughs> um, I'm Irish. Every, I think I, every, I think everybody's got that. I drank a little story. Like I don't I don't drink all that much, and I've got I've got at least three of them because I was the guy who had to clean up all the messes. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was. You know, it was. I I love red wine. Mm -hmm. I was always. You know, I, I love wine, and uh, I really got into it. Um, you know, after I moved out to LA because Napa Valley right there. And I was just, I started really understanding wine. So I've been, I, anytime I go to a con, I go and I, I love to find local wines wherever I am, if they have any, you know? So <clears throat> that's been a, a wonderful thing because of cons. I've been able to taste wines at so many wine regions in like every one of them in Australia and places in Canada. And, and yeah, it's just been amazing. Truth, truth be told, um, 
I didn't I didn't start getting back into wines until about until about a year ago, and that's mainly because I ended up learning about the um, the Kotzwein incident way too early than I should have. The what incident? Um, are you fam- are you familiar with the with the um, with the uh, wine poisoning incident that happened in Austria? I think in the eighties. No. It's now. There's been a few people who have done video documentaries on YouTube on it, and um, it's something that I'd have a hard time summarizing. But basically, around that time, sweet wines were very were very popular in Eastern Europe. Um, yeah, especially in especially in Germany and Austria was a major exporter of that, and somebody had tried to um, had tried to cheat had tried to cheat it because in order to get sweet wine, obviously you need to have it on the grape uh, not not the grape on the uh, vine a lot longer than normal, right? And somebody tried to use a chemical additive to cheat the system, except the problem was the combination of that additive and, as well as the rest of the stuff that's used in the production of wine caused a ma- caused a mass poisoning incident that almost killed the wine industry in Austria. Wow, I didn't know about that. Yeah, and hearing about that kind of story at a young age, which was told to me as a ki- as a, as a cautionary tale of what happens when you try and take shortcuts, um, basically turned me off of wine for years. <laughs> yeah. Um, plus, I'm in the Midwest. Most people, most people sure. are beer drinkers around here. Oh, absolutely. Um, but when, but um, would you, now, I know that you're also well known as known for a lot of um, public speaking aside, beyond just conventions. And would you say that do that um, that doing acting ha- helped when it came when it came to the shift to doing public speaking events? Oh, absolutely. I mean, well, see, here's the thing. As far as public speaking, my main public speaking does come from uh, conventions, Mm -hmm. and you know, then I get to do some other around different places. And now that I'm a coach and I can, you know, train corporations and things like that, we're Mm -hmm. building up that. But for so many years, uh, I've done you know speaking for Fortune 500 companies, Mm -hmm. Um, like in Houston when I said, you know, you do everything. Well, public speaking was part of it. And being a presenter for, let's say, you know, BP Amico or HP or mm-hmm. Marathon Oil or something, and they have a live event and they need somebody to deliver a speech, that would be me, but not – it wouldn't be my words. It would be their words. And you know, so I've done a lot of that, and it's just part of what you do. So I already had the grounding in it because you know, when, when you're a young actor and they say, can you do this? Yes. What is it? <laughs> that's how you do it you know mm-hmm. can you fence yes what's fencing <laughs> I, you know, um... you figure as fast as you can and uh, that's kind of how I did it it's like you know because I would use there's an interesting thing that when you're doing a live talk and you don't have time to memorize it all you got like you know 30 minutes of stuff and you're like I can't memorize that it's it's tomorrow mm-hmm. so you do what's called an uh, audio prompting and it was in the day you would put you'd have a little tape recorder and you would tape the you would read the script into the tape recorder rewind it all and you would put it in your pocket and you would have a wire coming from that up your shirt around up the back of your shirt or, and loop around your ear and plug in one of your ears mm-hmm. so you would play it and you could hear it in your ear and as you could hear it in your ear you would speak it oh yeah um it's called audio prompting mm-hmm. and it's it, people would say man that's great. I'm like, yeah, I don't have a clue what I just said, but I sound great saying it. <laughs> you know, and they come up to me and I go, okay, so tell me about this VOIP thing. And I'm like going, I'm sorry, I am the face. That's marketing over there in the blue shirts, <laughs> you know, because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I sound really good with it. So now I do, I can do trainings and, and coachings of my own mm-hmm. uh, that I know how to do. And I've done speaking where it's just like, okay, I can, I can go off the cuff or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and that's – acting is part of it. That's mm-hmm. why you take acting and that's why you do training in like Toastmasters and speaking and things like that. You have to get up and do it mm-hmm. because you get up in front of 100 people and you go, bleak, bleak, bleak. And you can't say anything. You don't look great. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, so you got to get used to that. And, you know, I've had stage fright Mm -hmm. before. Even as an actor in college, I was always on stage. I can do whatever. But then I had to do the curtain speech where you go out in front and look at the people. You don't have a character to hide behind. And I just went, oh, God. (laughs) Yeah. And I had to get over that, and I figured out how to do it. So it's like anything else. Mm -hmm. You do it. You do what you fear, and the death of fear is certain. Mm -hmm. So do it. Get it over with. Get it done. Yeah. Grip it and rip it. Um, That's it. When it. It's fun. Funny thing about um. Sta- funny thing about stage fright, and I've mentioned this a couple times. I think um, because the funny thing is, even when I did acting for a brief amount of time, I didn't get stage fright all that much, and I kind I kind of credit um watching and imitating so many stand up comedians. Yeah. Um, the closest thing I had to that was an instance where the person I was acting opposite forgot their lines, and I had to find I had to improvise a way to mouth cues for cues for their lines while not letting anybody else see it. Which, right. Which um, for for like the second time I was do, I was doing that kind of thing was um, a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Um. Now when it, now you've mentioned a few of the books that you that you had um. That you had written, um, don't kill your date and other cooking tips. How to be a freaking genius voice actor and so on. Um, talk to me about the story when it came to actually actually hunkering down and choosing to write those books. Was it just one of those things that happened naturally, or did somebody um, convince you to give it a shot? Well, it depends. So it was it was three of them that I did, and one. It's interesting because the first one was. Uh, when I first started doing conventions, mm-hmm. I noticed I didn't have anything to sell, and I needed something. So I wrote a book. I said, what do I know? What do I know? What can I teach? And I was like, well, I could teach real estate because I did that for 10 years. I'm like, no, no that's not the crowd. <laughs> so I was like, well, voiceover. I can I can teach voiceover. Mm-hmm. I can teach voiceover. So I was like, okay, how to be a freaking genius voice actor, step one, uh, which is all about – you know, using your voice as an instrument. It's not about, hey, here's how you go become a famous voice actor. Do, mm-hmm. do. No, it's not that. Mm-hmm. Because most people will never go that far. Um, but they want to learn a little bit about their voice. So I just wrote that and I sold that at conventions and turned it into an audio book. Um, it's not available on Amazon. I haven't done that yet. Um, I may do that down the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll see. But uh, the second one that I came out with was called What Happens at the Con Stays at the Con. That one was easier – well, it was, it was kind of easier to write because I love to write and stories, tell stories and have fun. And people kept telling me these crazy stories of things that happen at conventions. And I was like, OK, well, then I'll write a story about that. I'll add some characters. I'll move some things around and you know, make it fun. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of wrote it. I would just chill out, relax, and write. And it turns out it was – quite funny. And I started doing that and honed the stories because one of my panels that I would do was that book. So it was like a late night panel. Let's all have a drink and I'll tell you some stories, you know, some crazy stuff. Uh, And as I usually say, it's like uh, I have a lot of crazy con stories, some of which I instigated. And it just, it was, it was a lot of fun. I actually just recently, I think last year, put that out on Amazon as volume two i added some more stories to it and now it's a full-fledged book available on amazon now that's right go get your copy of what happens at the gone stays at the gone that's my commercial thanks um (laughs) and then uh so what happened so don't kill your date and other cooking tips was a dating panel it started out as a dating panel um which was really a self-help thing for me because i was learning to to get my game going again Mm -hmm. i was 35 and i had to start over and I had lost everything. I was at the lowest point of my life. I mean, it was starting over from scratch with no self-esteem, you know, nothing. Mm-hmm. And so I had to figure out how to get back into the world and date and be a better person, a better, you know, the best man I could be. And that's what I did. And as I started doing that, I started going to conventions. So a few years later, I was like, well, I'll do a panel on dating. So I came up with Don't Kill Your Date and other cooking tips because that's how I was dating. I would have women come to my apartment and I would cook Mm -hmm. and it became a really great vehicle. So it worked, it worked really well. And I dated a lot Mm -hmm. and had a lot of fun. 
And I was like, well, hey, guys, here's how you do it. So here's some recipes. Here's you know how you become that person. It wasn't about tricking anybody. It wasn't about manipulation in any way, shape, or form. It was about becoming the best man you can be so that a woman will come over to your apartment to hang out with you while you wield a sharp instrument and still feel safe. You know, <laughs> um, And that's the cool part about it. So that became mm – -hmm. That became Food Game, A Man's Ultimate Recipe for Dating Success, which is available on Amazon now. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, – it went to number one in two, uh, two categories on my launch. So mm -hmm. that was nice. So I know mm -hmm. people do dig it. Um, but yeah, I haven't really marketed it all that much. But it's a really good book. Mm -hmm. It really is. I've got lots of good star – five-star reviews and it works, guys. Mm -hmm. You know, It works. And I'm working on one now for for women because they've been asking me. They've been like, you know, I, well, why don't you tell us, help us? Because I've been on many women centric podcasts with my coaching, and they're like, how do you know all this stuff? I'm like, well, I dated a bunch of you, you know. I mean, <laughs> I did some research and um, I talked a lot, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I've learned a lot. So that's those are the three books that I have, and two of them are on, available on Amazon. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how those uh, came about. Yeah. Now, I will admit that when I was doing when I was doing my um, research and pre and prep for this and prep for this show, um, there were a few there were a few things that I had saw that um, I had to raise an eyebrow about because I f I figured when I found these that there was probably a bit more context on, on this. Um, first one that I wanted to ask about is shaving your head. <laughs> yeah. So it was awesome. How um how did you what. Um, how did you end up getting to how did you end up getting to, to Mount Koi? And just tell me the circumstance around around shaving your head by a, cool. um, by a Buddhist monk in um, Mount Koya. Okay, absolutely. One of my coolest uh, moments in life. It's you know when I travel, I love adventure. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things I did when we were in uh, Japan, this was with my first wife. And we did uh, Tokyo. We went all the way south to Kyushu to Beipu, Hiroshima, Kyoto. Mm -hmm. uh, had had Kobe beef in Kobe, uh, and had um, uh, went to Mount Koya and stayed at a Buddhist uh, monastery. It was one of the most beautiful places on earth. Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal. And <clears throat> so when I'm there, I was like, you know what? When in Rome, um, <laughs> I I looked and I would I asked the uh, uh, asked one of the monks. I was like. Um, do you think uh, it would be possible to have my head shaved? And he looked at me and go, head shaved? <laughs> I'm like, yes, uh, could you shave my head? I'll, I'll pay, whatever. Uh, you want to be monk? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, not worthy and also married. Um, he's like, but shave head? I'm like, yes. He said, ah. And that's where – that's all that happened then. And so I'm at dinner. Uh, with with my then wife and we're in our own little place and we see this little uh, the shoji screen mm -hmm. and uh, we see a little woman's figure coming to it she kneels down opens up the shoji screen and and bows to us and we bow at her and, and then she's like uh, you want to be monk <laughs> I'm like no I uh, see apparently uh, a, a woman will run the place I didn't know that mm -hmm. I didn't know that they had it's like it's like the the den mother you know mm -hmm. um, and so she was coming over to me, and she's like, you want to be monk? I'm like, no, 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 no. I just, uh, you know, I'm no disrespect. I just wanted to see if I could get my head shaved. I think it would be a, a unique experience. She's like, but no be monk? I'm like, no. She says, okay, after dinner. And then she takes off. <laughs> and I'm like, apparently after dinner, I'm getting my head shaved. All right, let's do this. Yeah. And so uh, then we're, we're done with dinner, and we're walking out back to our room. And uh, this amazing, ebullient monk that I have never forgotten, his name is Yanagi, and he was fabulous. And he goes, ah, you want to be monk? <laughs> like, no, dude, I don't want to be a monk. No be monk? And I'm like, no, no be monk. And there were, yes, there was a little Scooby-Doo in his voice. That <laughs> no be monk? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, dude, um, he's like, no, no, I, I don't want to be monk. I just want my head shaved. And he says, okay, let's go. <laughs> and we went and I had my head shaved. And it was October in Mount Koya and it was cold and I had no hat and I did not realize oh, when you God. Shave your head, it gets cold. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, it was it was amazing, phenomenal, and I highly recommend it to anybody. Yeah. I've um I already had my head shaved shaved once and um 
It was. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. It wasn't. It probably. It wasn't mountainous cold, but it was. St- it was still in the cool weather, and and I was heading out. To, I was going to be heading out to the forest for this camp that I was a part of at the time, and getting that first blast of of autumn air in the middle of a forest when you when you just got shaved bald two days ago is an experience because you end up oh, feeling yeah. that all on your scalp and i'm pretty sure it was the exact same way for you well here's the cool thing so during the day mm-hmm. there's a there's it up there is uh the burial place of kobo daishi who is the founder of shinto buddhism mm-hmm. and it's a long it's a mile long walk through big trees and lots of monuments and it's just gorgeous and you get there to the end and there's a hall of lanterns so you go through it during the day mm-hmm. and it's you know stunning and gorgeous and they say oh no you got to do it at night as well so okay great so then i had my head shaved and then i'm heading out at night so it's cold and it's dark and there's literally one little kind of street lamp every quarter mile other than that it's pure darkness surrounded by these woods and i was like oh my lord ninjas are going to jump out any moment and you know attack us i think in, i think in that and, situation would be more scared of wolves than ninjas you know i wouldn't know but but we went and all the way to the end and then the the hall of lanterns is illuminated and gorgeous it was it was a one of a kind thing and you're like the only people there mm-hmm. it was amazing i mean i have stories like this all over the world and just different crazy things I've done. Mm-hmm. But that was that was amazing. It was something I, I will never forget. It was just really, really something. So yeah, go to Mount Koya. Have yeah. your head shaved. Enjoy. Um, well I have on my I have on my bucket I have on my bucket list go go see Wrestle Kingdom at the Tokyo Dome one of these days. So I'll also put that on the list as well. <laughs> there you go. It's, look I I like I love I love Puro Resu. In fact in fact when some once Wrestle Kingdom comes up in January, I'm probably going to be watching that on Japan time. So I'll right. need some extra caffeine for that. But nice. w- given given some given the whole adventure thing that you've that you've mentioned, and I do find I find it interesting that up until that we had we had mentioned your ta- your times in Houston and in LA, which are both fairly warm climates. Yeah. Tell me. Tell. Do you have? Tell me if you've got a story about getting about going to a colder climate dur- during this whole travel the world thing. And what was it like getting that first blast of cold air? Well, see, it's funny. Cold, I know. I grew up in Oklahoma City as well, mm-hmm. and so we had a lot of snow there. But going to from Houston, going to um, Lake Tahoe, that was amazing because it was winter and did. Uh, snowmobiling and I mean it was so much snow you couldn't see the person ahead of you <laughs> except you saw a light you know and then oh, the light I, turned to mm-hmm. like oh crap you know where am I, <clears throat> yeah, I know and that, that was pretty cool as far as snow goes I think that was the most snow uh, I've ever really dealt with mm-hmm. but uh, you know I love I love snow as long as I'm inside you know sipping a nice whiskey and by a fire I love snow yeah yeah, yeah. Love it. I, I love me some snow because, hey, it's free ammo. <laughs> it's what? It's free ammunition. Well, there you go. Yes. <laughs> Those are, that is fun as well. Yeah. And oh, I did ski. I skied a little bit too. I, I was like bunny slope. That's it. I'm like, nope, I'm not that good. Um, my wife loves, my now wife loves to uh, snowboard. So she tries to do that at least once a year, at least when we were in. LA, she would go up to Big Bear or something and, and do some skiing. I mean, some snowboarding. Mm-hmm. But for me, I'm all about that uh, that hot toddy in the fireplace, baby. <laughs> around in now, I've, I mentioned this before we went live, but I'm from Minnesota, and that kind of weather we always call it um, sleeping weather. <laughs> exactly. Um, I I think I did one di- one diamond th- thing skiing once, and I decided, yeah, that's enough for that. <laughs> Wow. It's straight. It's straight. Bun- it's straight bunny for me from now on. He- from here on out. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but is now, of course, you've you've um you've mentioned you mentioned trying out fo- trying out foods all over the place, which leads me to ask the um semi obvious question: Can you handle spicy, or is or do you lean a bit more towards having a baby mouth? Oh, bring me spicy, baby! Come on, <laughs> I'm from Texas. 
I have I have no problem with spicy, and especially it's interesting here in Australia. I I'll make chili or mm-hmm. tacos and stuff, and I have their chili powder here is not like American chili powder. As a matter of fact, I'm about to have some chili powder shipped over from uh, the states so I can have that flavor. There's a depth of flavor, especially like hatch chilies out of like Albuquerque. Oh, mm-hmm. good stuff. Um, but here it's most of the chilies are like from India, sort of thing. So they're mm-hmm. quite hot, and not as not the depth of flavor. So it's kind of been interesting for that, but you know, like I like Indian food, bring it, make it kind of spicy. Mm. I like I like a good amount of spice, but not too much where it's you know torching your freaking brain. There's what's the purpose of that? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'm not going to see you. Have, I'm not going to see you have the um, one chip challenge or something crazy like that anytime soon. No, I want to enjoy my food. Mm. I don't mind some spice, some heat to it. You know, but it's got to be good. Like like barbecue wings, I want some good spice. And I I make my own wings with the classic recipe. Frank's mm-hmm. Red Hot. I add butter, maybe a little bit of vinegar, and a touch of sugar. Boom, mm-hmm. done. And it is perfect every yeah. time. And it does eat away at your freaking lips, but it's worth every second. Yeah. Since you mentioned barbecue and being and being a man from Texas, I have to I have to ask this question that um. Always ends up putting me in an awkward situation, given some of my colleagues. Mm. Have you ever had a situation where you've had where you've had to be right in the middle of one of those barbecue arguments between men from Texas and men from Kansas City? Sure, I've had <laughs> uh, I've had barbecue in Kansas City and Texas and uh, North Carolina and you know all over Tennessee. And, you know it doesn't matter. I've, I've tried all kinds and I know a lot about barbecue and I love it. I have a I have a pit. That is huge. Uh, that I slow smoke Texas style. Mm-hmm. Um, I slow smoke Texas style. You know, the twelve to sixteen hours or more. Oh yeah. And um, so, hold on. There's Mama. Go, go talk to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Um, but uh, you know, I've never been in the argument of it. It's been. Yeah, I'm gonna go in the other room. Okay. Hold on, buddy. I'm going to go in the other room while I can finish up chatting with you. All right. Oh, that was my three-year-old asking <laughs> for snacks <laughs> incessantly. All right. You know, oh, and I'm sorry I didn't I didn't have a better uh, microphone. Uh, Kim has the, the microphone because she is in, uh, I guess I'm... Oh, no, no worries. I... I have been. I've never been under any illusion that I'm that my show is going to be the prettiest. In fact, that's part of the charm. Is as as I said as I said in the past, it's it's not meant it's not meant to be pretty. It's not me, it's not meant to be glamorous. It's just a it's just a bunch of jagoffs who like to share stories. Okay, had to check. Mm-hmm. She's doing a training, and I'm like, am I on camera? It looks like I am. No, uh, okay. Oh, this is better. I can see the ocean from here. It's pretty in here. <laughs> just spend more time over here. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, as far as the argue, barbecue argument goes, man, it's, you know, people get really comfortable with it. I like it all. Oh, yeah. You know, I've found some really good uh, barbecue sauce down here mm-hmm. uh, in Australia. And I was like, what? No way. It was really good. And I'm actually, you know, loving my Texas uh, stuff. I still like the sweetness of the, uh, like, Memphis and Kansas City uh, barbecues. And my two favorite, well, there's three. I got three barbecues. That I that I love my top three. Number one is actually in Kansas City, and it was Oklahoma Joe's, mm-hmm. amazing. And number two was the Pork Pit in Jamaica, and number three is my own, <laughs> because I learned it from a guy at the Chilimpiad in you know Southeast Texas, mm-hmm. and uh, so I was just like, man, once I get the right flavors, it is oh, unbeatable, unbeatable. <laughs> so and you know what's interesting um so here in australia they're all about you know shrimp on the bobby mike great mm. love it mm. well yeah their barbecues are like they're not barbecues they're they're flat metal grills with a hole in the middle where you scoop all the juice and junk in uh so all the stuff drains off or whatever mm-hmm. and they're held clean and they're everywhere I'm like, that's not a grill, people. <laughs> so I don't know how to cook on those things yet. It's annoying. Is it? I'm guessing it's not from lack of trying. I've tried it a few times. I'm just like, I don't enjoy this. 
it's a pain because then you got to clean this thing up and they don't give you tools to clean it. It's like, what am I supposed to clean this thing with? They give you a, uh, they give you basically a spatula from, um, like Home Depot where mm-hmm. you, you know, you do sheet rock spackle. They give you yeah. that. And it's like, you're clean that. And it's like, it's not going to do anything. So anyway, I'm bitching. <laughs> I'm bitching in paradise. <laughs> Every, look, look, it's, that's the that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of the monastery is here is this is the place where people get to bitch about those kind of things. Yeah. Um, well, let me tell you, um, as far as food wise, just so you know, so we're staying down here, right? No, nope, mm-hmm. Qantas isn't flying, so we're not going anywhere. We mm-hmm. packed for three weeks. We're here for nine months. Go figure. So we love it. We just got an apartment, and I'm going to go to culinary school in January, or February, so that I can get a student visa, so we can stay down here. So in two years. I'm going to be a freaking chef. There you oh. go. Well, there you go. Um, just because I want to. <laughs> yeah. Be, best, best of luck. Sur- best of luck surviving cook. Best of luck surviving cooking school. I know how, um, I know how certain chefs can get. <laughs> oh, this one so far, it, it looks good. I've already met some people. I'm like, no, I'm good. Yeah. Cool. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to the Le Cordon Bleu. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure if you did that, they'd eat you alive and spit you out. I'd um, love it. I would love it. <laughs> I'm a of, foodie. Come of course, of course, of course. Mentioning that, it, mentioning that, I can just see you with the expression of "Don't threaten me with a good time." <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there was one thing that was listed as a personal quote on your um, IMDb page that I wanted to ask about because I get the feeling there's a bit of a story to this. The whole, if you're going to go with hentai, I say jump in with both feet. If you want safe, stick with Disney. What is the story behind that quote? I have no idea. I, I don't know where they got that from. That is... I have no idea. I, I literally... IMDB, anybody can put anything up there. Yeah. And I've asked... I'm like, I don't remember that quote. I have no idea. You know? I mean, hentai is like... I don't watch hentai. I've, I've done a hentai. I've mm-hmm. voiced a hentai. I was like, whoa, that's some weird shit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I did the one, and I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> that's all, that's so, off the bucket list. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, okay, I, I voiced, there was tentacle penises, okay, good, we're good, check. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so I don't know what that is, <laughs> to be honest, so I wish I could tell you more. Yeah, it's, I thought I thought it was a bit odd, and I, was, I figured it was a 50-50 shot of either somebody decide, somebody at IMDb decided that they were going to be cute, or there, or there was a bit more to the story, and I, I figured it was a long shot, so it's a case of... Well, worst that could happen is it is it's a case of no idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll. You know, I may have said it somewhere, mm-hmm. but I don't know how do you how do they find a quote? Because I I just it was so funny. I just um, I have a something I I tell everybody to do is mm-hmm. get a Google alert with your name, so when somebody does something with your name, you get to see it, mm-hmm. and you can check on it real quick. And well, what I did was it was so funny. <laughs> Um, somebody was quoting my book and it was awful, not a native English speaker. And it was one of the funniest damn things I have ever read. <laughs> it was hysterical. Um, well, and, now you got me uh, curious uh, <laughs> exactly how yeah. badly did they botch it? Oh my God. It's, it, I can't even explain it. I, I posted it on my Facebook some, it, it was, it was like, uh, you know, months ago mm-hmm. and it was hysterical. Uh, and what they were saying, and I'm like, wow, they have no idea what my book is. They they got the title wrong. They got everything <laughs> wrong. It was just, you know, they misspelled my name like in the same sentence. I mean, it's just bizarro. It's yeah. like, was this written by a computer? Because it's funny as hell, but I have no idea what they're talking about. And uh, so you never know. I I, I like I, I say I'm from the uh, the George Carlin school. I don't believe anything, anything. <laughs> Because <laughs> that, that's just, I mean, he doesn't believe anything. He said, I don't believe anything my government tells me ever. Yeah. I'm like, great. I, I'm the same way. But I'm the same way with just almost everything on the internet anymore. It's like, you know, I repost a story and somebody goes, this is not a real story. This happened four years ago and it was found false and you're a blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, Jesus. I just hit, I just hit share, you jackass. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't need all this stuff. Yeah. So I think that's one of the, one of the little landmines uh, that I just go away from anymore. It's like somebody says, "Oh, you did this." I'm like, "Yeah, prove it." Um, and when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to those sort of things, 
um, I'll always even bef- even before the internet was a thing, there 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 were issues with that. Have Have you ever heard of the SoCal hoax? The what? SoCal hoax. S O K A L. No. Um, short version is that a um, a guy wanted to show that the, that certain postmodern science journal jur- um, journals had no had had didn't ha- weren't doing their due diligence when it came to peer review and ch- and checking submissions. And right. he put out a submission that would that if you actually if someone actually sat down and read it. It would be patently ridiculous. It wouldn't pass peer review, and it would probably get the author laughed at. Of and course. it got published. <laughs> <laughs> and the and the and it got published to the point where it was looked at as legit. It was not only getting published; it was yeah. getting cited. It was getting quoted, and he had to step forward. Is like, I have been fucking with you this entire time. No. <laughs> yeah. Because, because he wanted to make a point that they, that they weren't following their uh, scientific standards and checking and doing pe- and doing peer review like they're supposed to. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of that stuff out mm-hmm. there. I'm, that's why just it's like you know anybody can post anything. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's why I, I when I post stuff, I'm like, hey, this is my opinion. Mm-hmm. This is my view. This is my book. Like it? Don't like it? Don't care. Now, one of the things I wanted, to, one of the things I did want to ask ab- about um, was the Mind Scrambler podcast, and I, I will admit that it's going to sound odd about t- talking about a podcast while I'm o- while I'm on a podcast. So, if I had not the Inception all, horn, I'd be blowing it right now. <laughs> um, how did the Mind Scrambler um, get started? Was it was it just something that was suggested to you? Was it something that was on a bucket list? How did it end up coming about? Well, I was I I've been wanting to do a podcast for a while. And I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to call it? What am I going to who am I going to talk to? And I started thinking, you know, it's mindset. It's all about mindset and uh, rewiring your brain because, you know, what's why I call it the mind scrambler is because we have so much junk in our heads. And so I wanted to be kind of a coaching thing, but I also wanted to be um topical in in certain ways it's like you know like a, one of the things i'll i i did was called get off my lawn mm-hmm. uh, and i say like get off my lawn and it's about claiming your own internet space on your socials and not mm-hmm. being bullied by other people leaving comments etc cetera, etc cetera. it's how mm-hmm. to deal with that kind of thing and so i try to deal with everyday issues and it's predominantly at this point it could be for anybody i mean my mm-hmm. the things i teach are universal and this comes straight from my my coaching trainings and my life and business and and you know speaking in front of thousands and knowing what i'm talking about in different arenas and i was like you know i'm just going to go ahead and do it and i i predominantly say it's for people in the geek nerd world mm-hmm. you know cuz that's that's people that are those are my people that's who i can get to that's who under, who's probably listening to me or possibly fans of some of my work or somewhere similar and now i'm bringing in guests that are kind of in the geek nerd world uh, or they're in the business world with a secret geek out mm-hmm. and they're all into personal growth and self help that's wholly what it's all behind because let's say there's 40 million let's say anime fans out there mm-hmm. they're not the biggest people in personal growth and self development you know and mm-hmm. and they nobody's really gearing anything towards them and helping them mm-hmm. so i have that and a membership group called the reluctant heroes journey uh, that I'm opening again in uh, January in 2021, and it is a membership where I do coaching inside of that, and it's predominantly for people in that world, and that's kind of how I'm starting off, and it'll branch out later. But I figure, you know, somebody needs to help. I've been in front of thousands of them, and the the things that I learn and I know from the business world and personal growth and such, um, they don't know these techniques, tips, tricks, mm-hmm. and things trainings they don't know these things and i'm like anybody in business knows for the most part like who tony robbins is who les brown is and you know who brendan bouchard may be you know there's all these different people and coaches and trainers that they have gone through but in our world they don't know those things so they don't have access to ways to help themselves to Mm -hmm. get past depression to get over things and move forward and have success in their lives and build community and have friends and that's kind of where it came from. And uh, 
uh, yeah, it's it, the funny part was, you know, I talk about my the subconscious mind a lot, mm-hmm. and I went to bed and when I was working on figuring out the podcast, and I said, all right, subconscious mind, go to bed tomorrow, tell me what I need to do. I said, what's what am I going to call it? What am I going to do? Let me know. And I'm sitting there in my and the reason why I say the subconscious, you guys, anybody that understands the subconscious, it's the kind of thing where you're looking at a problem, you can't figure it out, and then you go take a walk on the beach or you take a shower, and suddenly the answer is there mm-hmm. because you're not thinking about it anymore. It lets your subconscious mind do it. And so I was standing at the kitchen, and I remember I had this scene in my head, boom, weird science in the shower of the, her uh, – Kelly LeBrock. You know, you should shower with them. It's a mind scrambler. I went, bam, mind scrambler podcast. I knew it. I knew it, and it, I was like, "Come on, there's no way the mind scrambler is not already taken." It was not taken. <laughs> I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" So there it is, and it's a double entendre. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, it's a double entendre. <laughs> it is amazing because in the dating world, the mind scrambler is multiple orgasms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I cover the dating world, I cover the mindset, I cover business, I cover the nerd geek world. I got it all with the mind scrambler. Come on in. Check it out on iTunes, baby. Mm-hmm. And now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to that pot when it comes to that particular show, do you ha- do you have a set um do you have a set day when new episodes come out or is it a case of things are out when they're out? Well, I go live every day. Um, on my Facebook, uh, Twitch, and my YouTube channel uh, every day at noon, Monday through Friday here in Australia, which is like 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. or something like that over in the States. And I just do the Mind Scrambler show, which is just me talking. Mm-hmm. You know, I talk to people if they have questions for me, if they want anything, you know, whatever. We just talk, we just chat. And Every now and then, I will do a podcast during one of those sessions. Mm-hmm. But all the podcasts the, themselves, they they are on iTunes, so they're all out, and they're also on my website at spikespencer dot com uh, slash podcast. All of them are up there, even the ones that haven't come out on iTunes yet. So, yeah, I mean it's it's just stream of consciousness. I'll I'll get like a, I call it a divine download. I'm like, "Oh, today I'm going to be talking about, you know, bullying this or today I'm going to be talking about how to forgive people that are dicks." I mean, uh, today I'm going to talk about, you know, whatever. It's like I my titles I love. I have fun with some of them like hindsight isn't 2020. Hindsight's kind of a dick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you farted and that's okay. So, <laughs> there's there's fun stuff. I like to have fun with it, but I I give real coaching i give real ideas and and tips Mm -hmm. that people can actually use and you know i enjoy doing it it's kind of a passion of mine yeah now and now i'm guests mm -hmm. (laughs) full circle um yeah and with with that with that in mind um what do you have what now beyond of course future episodes of uh, mind scrambler what do what do you have coming down the pipe that um that can, that people can be looking forward to. That you, obviously, um, that you can, that you can talk on. I know how this works sometimes. Sure. Well, right now the the podcast is the main thing. Um, mm-hmm. I do trainings. Like like I said, I'm opening up the Reluctant Heroes uh, Journey membership, uh, and that's important. That's something that that people will actually. It's not just the podcast. It's actual training and community. Uh, and that's important for people in the geek nerd world. So if they want to look into that, I just always tell everybody, look, go to my website, go to the voice tab because i got a fan club, and that's my email. And you just go in there, get on my email list, and you'll know. Uh, that's that's the main thing. I've got some voiceover, uh, some gigs that are coming out, but I can't say anything about them yet. So mm-hmm. there's nothing – There's you know, just keep an eye out. Uh, things are coming. Yeah. Uh, and – as far as coaching goes, like I said, working on another book, that could be a year or two down the road. Who knows? could be in six months. Um, but, you know, just keep in touch mm-hmm. and, you know, enjoy the, our adventures here in Australia because mm-hmm. we're here. and We're not going anywhere for a while, so it's a very interesting thing. So you can catch me on my fan, Facebook fan page, uh, Twitch, and, of course, Twitter, and uh, my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. I'd love anybody and everybody that's listening to this. Go subscribe to them all and join the conversation. Come see me because I'm there every day, Monday through Friday, 
and uh, yeah, I'd love to love to chat with you. Yeah. With with that with that in mind, I once again I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of out of your schedule and braving the insanity of time zones to come up to the temple. Oh. No problem mm-hmm. at all, man. I'm yeah. I, I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> and anytime you see fit to ret- to return to our hallowed halls, the do- the door is always open. As I often say around I'm here, up. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, you know, the thing is, your happy hour where you are is my morning. So unless I'm having a, you know, a mimosa, it ain't happening. <laughs> well, I said drinking. I didn't say what kind. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing? Pancakes and mimosas. Sounds like a winner to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and and well, around here, pancakes for dinner is a long-running tradition, so hey. there's precedent. Yes, but a red or white wine with that? That's the question. Yes. <laughs> we call it a slushy. <laughs> I try to keep my options open is all. There you go. Yeah. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!